And you, you can have your main event of the evening. Hello and welcome to These Days Are Hours, a Happy Days podcast. I'm Peter. And I'm Joe. And today we are discussing Season 10, Episode 13, I Drink, Therefore I Am. Okay, Peter, tell us what happens in I Drink, Therefore I Am. We open with the Winter Carnival Decorating Committee of Casey, Jenny, Bobby, and Melvin meeting in Arnold's. Who wants to be recording secretary? Oh! Here it is! Darn it, I wanted that job! Fonzie arrives, in a bad mood because he just found out his barber, the only one he's ever had, has died. Now who's going to cut his hair? Flip shows up with his two new friends, Mark and Kelly. Kelly once got drunk at a party and threw up on the front lawn. Flip himself is tipsy at the moment, and he flirts with Jenny and makes fun of the committee. Jenny, have I ever told you how gorgeous you are? You are drunk. (laughs) Roger steps in, telling Flip not to hang out with Kelly's crowd, and failing to get through to him. A week later at the Cunningham house, Four barbers are waiting in the living room to audition for Fonzie, much to Howard's consternation. What are they doing in our living room, huh? Well, Arthur is still auditioning barbers up at his place, and he didn't think it was fair for the barbers to see their competition, and, you know, Rudy would have wanted it that way. Roger storms in, furious that there's nothing he can do about Flip's bad behavior. Howard advises Roger to be firm with Flip, while Marion advises leniency, and if that doesn't work, whack him on the behind until he glows in the dark. The next day at Arnold's, Roger tries to be relatable and friendly to Flip, and let him decide whether or not to drink now that he has all the information. You're not going to yell at me? No. (laughs) No, that was your brother Roger yelling. This is your pal, Raj. Casey and Jenny invite Flip to help them hang up posters, but Kelly and Mark invite him to drink beer they bought with money Mark got from selling his blood. At Ashley's apartment, Ashley is going to cut a nervous Fonzie's hair. If you sit down and if you're very good, I'll give you a lollipop. Oh, come on, Ashley. Let's get serious. That just works in a dentist's office, not here. While Heather and her friend go outside to ride their bikes. Outside, there's a squeal of tires, and Ashley looks outside to see that Heather has been hit by a car. Fonzie and Ashley bring Heather inside and set her down on the sofa. Luckily, Ashley isn't as badly injured as she could have been. Heather's friend says a yellow car sped through the crosswalk and hit Heather. And while Ashley takes her to the hospital, Fonzie swears revenge. I'm telling you, when I find them, I'm going to pick their tonsils out through their nose. At Arnold's, the committee has come up with a plan for the carnival. We decorate the gym like a giant Christmas tree, and we all come as ornaments. While Flip is horrified that he, Kelly, and Mark hit a kid while driving drunk. Kelly and Mark are more worried about themselves, and they plan an alibi. Where were we? Don't you remember? We went down to the wharf to get some beer. Mark, shut shut up. up. Flip decides to go to the police instead, and Kelly and Mark try to stop him. Fonzie enters and steps in, asking about a yellow car, and Mark blurts out that they were playing pinball, no, skee-ball, in their yellow car all night. Fonzie sees right through them, and is about to beat the two teenagers with a bench, when Flip admits he was with them too, and they were all drinking. Fonzie sends Kelly and Mark to turn themselves in, and shoes Flip out. We're drinking and driving? How stupid can you get? Doing things to impress your friends isn't cool. Knowing the difference between right and wrong is cool. Flip can apologize from now until doomsday, but that won't change what he did. Now it's time to turn himself in. The next day, Flip goes to Ashley's apartment while Heather is watching Bugs Bunny. It's my favorite cartoon. Yeah, mine too. He apologizes to Ashley, and she hugs him. He joins Heather and apologizes with a coloring book and a 64-pack of crayons. At the Cunningham house, Marion is cutting Howard's hair, after which she cuts Roger's hair. Okay, coach, who do you like in tomorrow's game? These happy days are yours and mine. These happy days are yours and mine. These are such happy days. Thank you, Peter. That was I Drink, Therefore I Am. It first aired back on January 11th, 1983. Happy Days was followed that night by a new Laverne and Shirley in which two Russian ballet dancers, one of whom looks exactly like Squiggy, try to defect to the United States, causing the KGB to come after Squiggy himself. Boy, j'aime moi. ABC aired the second half of the world's greatest athlete, that 1973 Disney movie about the track and field athlete who grew up in the jungle like Tarzan. Again, Jan Michael Vincent stars. And NBC aired The Return of Maxwell Smart, a Get Smart sequel movie in which Maxwell Smart is called upon to defeat a villain who threatens to deploy a bomb that destroys all clothing. Would you believe a criminal with one eye and a mad scientist who wears a pink stocking is about to blow up the earth? Uh, Would you believe blow the pants off everyone on the earth? Well, watch Agent 86 and his fellow agents for the return of Maxwell Smart. Sorry about that, Chief. 
on a special NBC movie of the week. Don Adams returns to the role that made him famous. Before coming to TV, this movie was actually released theatrically in 1980 as The Nude Bomb. So, Peter, of those three choices, what are you watching? I'm going to go with Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley tonight, just because that Laverne and Shirley episode sounds like a hotbed of terrible Russian accents, and I love terrible Russian accents. I'm very curious about where David Lander's Russian accent falls on that spectrum. Excuse me, comrades, but Fifiania and I, we are dancers, so naturally we swear. A lot. That does sound tempting, but I'm probably watching The Return of Maxwell Smart. I probably wouldn't have gone to a movie theater to see the Get Smart movie, but if it's playing on TV for free, sure, why not? There can't be that much nudity in it if they're showing it on TV. I don't think there was. I think it's the threat that the bomb will destroy the clothing, and I think if it ever does, it's like that Austin Powers thing where all the vital parts are covered up. Okay, you've convinced me. I'm, I'm going to watch The Return of Maxwell Smart, a.k.a. The Nude Bomb. I Drink Therefore I Am was directed by Jerry Paris and was written by the team of Gary Murphy and Larry Strother. This was their first Happy Days script. Gary never wrote for Happy Days again. I'm getting off this merry-go-round. He got his start writing for The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. He went on to quite a successful career as a writer-producer on shows like Night Court, Malcolm in the Middle, Men Behaving Badly, Caroline in the City, and more. In recent years, he's been working on Sydney to the Max, Alexa and Katie, and The Exes. As for Larry Strother, he wrote two more Happy Days scripts after this. In the 1980s, he kept working with Gary Murphy on Night Court, My Sister Sam, and The Sinbad Show. Together, Larry and Gary also wrote the 1988 comedy Without a Clue, starring Michael Caine as a drunken, fraudulent Sherlock Holmes. Academy Award with a Michael Caine Sherlock Holmes. He's a brawler, a lover, a nincompoop. Have you no respect for people's privacy? Worst of all, he's an actor. Once more, on to the breach, dear friend. After that, Larry worked on a talk show called Nightstand and the game show Most Extreme Elimination Challenge. Peter, had you ever heard of Without a Clue with Michael Caine? I think I might have, but I don't think I really thought about it until now. I should check that out. I like Michael Caine. As for guest stars this week, I will start with Dean Devlin as Mark. We still shouldn't run off like that. Yeah. How should we have run off? Dean is an actor turned writer producer from New York City. Before Happy Days, he'd had small roles in the films My Bodyguard and Harry and Walter Go to New York. After Happy Days, he guested on Fame, Hill Street Blues, Alice, Too Close for Comfort, Hardcastle and McCormick, L.A. Law, and Misfits of Science, among others. He's also in the classic 1985 movie Real Genius. But Dean truly made his impact as a screenwriter in the 1990s, penning such action blockbusters as Stargate, Universal Soldier, Independence Day, and Godzilla. As a producer, his credits include Stargate, Independence Day, Godzilla, The Patriot, Eight-Legged Freaks, and TV shows like Leverage, The Librarians, and The Ark. In recent years, he's gotten heavily into producing podcasts, including Inglorious Trexperts and Best Movies Never Made. So, Peter, what did you think of Dean Devlin as Mark? I think that he does a very good job at straddling the line between loathsome and funny. Like, I I was surprised at how funny Mark and Kelly are in this episode, considering that they did a hit and run on a little girl and tried to avoid taking any responsibility from it. The scene where they are planning on how to exactly do that, how to avoid taking responsibility for the manslaughter they almost committed of a child, is surprisingly funny, considering the topic. I can see why Dean Devlin got a lot of TV and film acting jobs before he became a big movie writer. My favorite moment of his in the episode is when he's almost swayed to go over to the poster committee because they're having cocoa afterwards. And afterwards, we all meet at my house for hot cocoa and little bitty marshmallows. Ooh, Mark. Oh. And he's like up for it, but then Kelly reels him back and says, no, we're going to go off and do something else. So I also like the part where we find out that he sold blood so that he and Kelly could have beer money. I guess that used to be a thing, selling your blood, because it's in a lot of television shows. We also have Joe Mays as Mr. Henri. Oh, nice hair. Joe was a character actor from Arkansas who worked steadily in TV and film from the late 70s to the early 90s. Gary Marshall had used him previously on Who's Watching the Kids. Joe also guested on Rhoda, Dallas, L.A. Law, Jake and the Fat Man, The Days and Nights of Molly Dodd. I haven't thought about that show in a while. It's Gary Shandling's show, Charles in Charge, Alf, Matlock, Family Matters, and The Golden Girls. His movies include The Seventh Sign, Spontaneous Combustion, directed by Toby Hooper, Future Kick, and Mr. Saturday Night. Tragically, he died of AIDS at the age of 45 in 1994. Peter, what did you think of Joe Mays as Mr. Henri? It's a small role. I don't know that it really gives him a lot to do, but it's a mildly amusing part of a mildly amusing B-plot. This barber thing doesn't take up much room in the episode. It sits weird with the main plot, which, again, is that Heather almost died 
dies in a hit and run. Yeah, I guess they felt like they needed to lighten up the story a little bit, and they added this barber subplot. Although even the barber story has a death in it. Yeah, this episode might have a tone problem. We also have Steve McGriff as Kelly Barnes. We're going to go have some real fun. Real fun. If you want to hang out with the Coco crowd, (laughs) be my guest. Steve had just a handful of TV acting roles in the 1980s. Besides Happy Days, he was also on Alice and Hotel. What did you think of Steve McGriff as Kelly Barnes? In his relationship with Mark, he's clearly the one who calls the shots. He's got more agency, and he's also got more evil than Mark. So pretty much everything I said that applies to Mark also applies to Kelly. He's surprisingly funny, but he's also more of a scumbag than Mark. He's obviously the chief scumbag in this episode, but they don't write him all that mean. In the 1980s, the main mean teen was James Spader. He would be the guy in your movie if you wanted a mean teenage boy. James Spader would play all his parts very sarcastic and making withering remarks to the other kids. Kelly is not really like that. James Spader specialized in playing preppy mean kids, and Kelly is more of a dirtbag mean kid. James Spader played the kind of kid who would steal liquor from his rich parents' cabinet, and Kelly just makes his friend sell blood so they can buy beer. They're two different species. They're on different rungs of the socioeconomic ladder, perhaps. And last but not least, we have Tammy O'Rourke as Tammy. What's the matter with him? His barber died? Tammy is the older sister of Heather O'Rourke. Like her sibling, Tammy was born in San Diego. She only dabbled in acting, making appearances as a dancer in both Annie and Pennies from Heaven. She got out of show business altogether and became a nurse at a correctional facility. And now I'm living in correctional facilities. Peter, what did you think of Tammy O'Rourke as Tammy? Finding out that she's played by Heather O'Rourke's real older sister does explain why Heather has a friend who is noticeably older than her. But Tammy is pretty good in the role. It doesn't really stretch her acting muscles, but she does all right. She's perfectly professional in the part. And now, the next time I watch Pennies from Heaven, maybe I'll look for Tammy O'Rourke. As for songs this week, at Arnold's we hear Do You Love Me by The Contours, Up on the Roof by The Drifters, Easier Said Than Done by The Essex, and One Fine Day by The Chiffons. Nothing new. I will say that I don't think Happy Days sound alike version of Do You Love Me by The Contours is all that convincing. It's the one that sounds the fakiest to me. Yeah, it's the one that sounds the most like a kid's bop cover. As for cultural and historical references, this episode takes its title from the first principle of French philosopher René Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. And René Descartes was a drunken fart, I drink, therefore I am. This quote originally appeared in his Discourse on the Method in 1637, and it has since become one of the fundamental ideas of Western philosophy. My favorite use of that phrase is actually in the 1970s sci-fi movie Dark Star, directed by John Carpenter. What concrete evidence do you have that you exist? I think, therefore I am. That's good. That's very good. Bobby jokes that Fruit of the Loom has stopped making t-shirts. The humble t-shirt has been with us since at least the 1910s, but it didn't really become an item of casual outerwear until after World War II, when servicemen brought that style home with them. Rest assured, Fruit of the Loom still manufactures them. Fonzie says that Rudy could have won the Wurlitzer Prize for hair. Yet again, Fonzie is combining at least two things here. Wurlitzer is a company founded in 1853 in Cincinnati by German immigrant Franz Wurlitzer. The company is famous for producing pianos or organs, and especially jukeboxes. Gee, Dad, it was a Wurlitzer. Meanwhile, Columbia University has been giving out the Pulitzer Prize since 1917 for journalism, literature, and musical composition. There is no category for hair, though. My name is Amy Archer, and I never won the Pulitzer Prize. In 1957. It's named for newspaper publisher Joseph Pulitzer. Peter, did you know that there was a Pulitzer Prize for music? It makes sense. Kendrick Lamar won a Pulitzer Prize. I didn't know him. Music is a form of writing, kinda. Flip says that all of Milwaukee smells like a brewery. God, it smells like a brewery in here. Breweries started popping up in Milwaukee in the 1860s for a few reasons, namely the city's high production of wheat and its large number of German settlers. So if you get a lot of wheat and a lot of Germans in one place, beer happens. Roger says that his necktie is a Don Loper. This happens to be a Don Loper. Don Loper was a costumer and necktie designer from Ohio who made his name working on MGM. He even designed uniforms for Pan Am and Trans World Airlines. Don died in 1972, but ties bearing the label Don Loper of Beverly Hills are still plentiful on eBay. Marion introduces the barbers as Mr. Vincent, Mr. Ed. Hello, I'm Mr. Ed and Mr. Henri. In the middle decades of the 20th century, it was common for prominent hairdressers to go by their first names with a Mr. added at the beginning. Real life examples include Mr. Kenneth and Mr. David. When Danny DeVito was a hairdresser, he went by Mr. Dan. I became a hairdresser. 
I worked for my sister. She had a beauty parlor. I got very good at it. I was Mr. Dan. Oh my gosh, Danny DeVito was a hairdresser? And I wondered, what happened to that tradition of hairdressers calling themselves Mr.? Mr. T called himself Mr. T because he felt that as a black man, otherwise nobody would address him as Mr. So maybe that's why hairdressers do it too. They do it so that you have to address them respectfully. Marion says that a barbershop quartet sang taps at Rudy's funeral. The bugle called taps has been played at military funerals since the 1840s, and someone has added a set of lyrics to this famous melody in case you ever want to sing it. No one knows who wrote those words or when, but they've been attributed to a Civil War soldier named Horace Lorenzo Trim. What do you mean attributed to? Have you ever heard taps with lyrics? I have not. It's out there if you want it. And Mr. Henri claims to have cut Elvis's cousin's hair. But did Elvis actually have any female cousins? I could not determine this by looking at his family tree, but it's very possible since his father Vernon and his mother Gladys both had siblings, and those siblings presumably had children of their own, one of whom must have been a daughter. Well, I've got a gal, she's as cute as she can be. She's a distant cousin, but she's not too distant with me. Marion says that if Flip goes to jail, he won't be able to vote. You know, he's going to wind up in jail. And then when he gets out of jail, he won't be able to get a decent job. He won't be able to vote. Fear not, Marion. In the state of Wisconsin, once prisoners have completed their sentences, their voting rights are restored. Good Flip for you, Wisconsin. And good for Flip once he gets out of jail. Marion also says that Howard knows more about teenagers than Dick Clark. If your Uncle Howard had known more about music, he could have had his own TV show. Clark became known as America's oldest teenager for hosting the long running dance party show American Bandstand from 1956 to 1989. By an astonishing coincidence, he became the host of the show after the previous host, Bob Horn, was arrested for drunk driving. Howard compares Roger to a Chinese finger puzzle. You're like a a Chinese finger puzzle. This is a cylinder of woven bamboo that traps the user's fingers. Trying to pull them out just makes it tighter. The solution is to push the ends toward the middle. No one knows when or where Chinese finger traps were invented, but they've become a metaphor for any problem that can be solved simply by relaxing. Peter, have you ever had a Chinese finger trap? Yes, they're one of those things that's more fun in theory than in practice. They're entertaining for about five seconds. Casey rejects Surf and Safari as the theme of the Winter Carnival. Never know, it is a winter carnival. The theme just cannot be Surf and Safari. This was a top 20 hit for the Beach Boys in 1962. And I had to disagree. I think having Surf and Safari as the theme of a winter carnival is kind of a novel idea. Obviously, in the Midwest, the cold, bleak winter stretches on for months. I think it might be fun to have a surfing and beach-themed carnival. You know, kind of a Christmas in July thing. Yeah. Roger says Flip can't consume alcohol until he's 18. Flip, we aren't going to go out and get any brewskis. You aren't 18. Roger, Roger, tell me, what is so magical about 18? And that seems to have been the legal drinking age in Wisconsin until 1986, when it was raised to 21. Fonzie says the Chicago Fire was just a weenie roast. Fonzie, it's only a haircut. Oh, yeah, right. The Chicago Fire was just a weenie roast. Oh, it's sit down. The Great Chicago Fire raged from October 8th to October 10th in 1871, destroying 3.3 square miles of the city and claiming 300 lives. And I have to be honest, I was a little underwhelmed by the death toll of the Great Chicago Fire. It was just 300 people. I mean, 300 people is a lot of people, but I thought it was like thousands. The Great Chicago Fire wasn't that great. I mean, it was an okay. <laughs> it was an o- oh, wow. <laughs> it was an okay Chicago fire. Fonzie also says that Rudy was at Anzio. And you don't know any war stories. You know that Rudy was at Anzio? <laughs> that infamous World War II battle stretched on for 136 days on the eastern coast of Italy in 1944. There were heavy casualties on both sides. 43,000 Allied soldiers, 40,000 Axis soldiers. The fighting dragged on for months without definitive progress, and many questioned the decisions of the Allied leadership. Fonzie says Ashley is a real nurse and compares her to Florence Henderson. And yet again, he is combining two names, Florence Nightingale, the English woman who pioneered the nursing profession during the Crimean War, and Florence Henderson, the Indiana-born singer and actress, best known for playing Carol Brady on The Brady Bunch. That show didn't debut until 1969, but Florence was already a fixture on game shows and variety shows, having appeared on TV regularly since the mid-1950s. She is currently on a coast-to-coast tour as the singing star of The Sound of Music. It's Florence Henderson. Hello, Gary. 
When Flip brings Heather a box of crayons, we see an example of what prop masters call greeking. That's taking commercially available products and altering them in some way so that the logos are not legible. In this case, you can tell the crayons are from Crayola, but it was someone's job to find electrical tape of the exact shade of green to cover up the name. Did you notice the greeking in this? Not until you pointed it out. Amazing. Heather is watching Bugs Bunny on TV. Bugs and the other Looney Tunes characters originally appeared in animated short films intended for theaters, with Bugs debuting in 1940. But these cartoons started airing on TV in the early 60s and garnered great ratings. This, folks, is a Warner Brothers television production. This was a mixed blessing, however, since the demand for new theatrical cartoons dried up and Looney Tunes died a slow, painful death in the 1960s. So TV brought the Looney Tunes to a new audience, but it also killed Looney Tunes, ultimately. Have you ever seen those late 60s Looney Tunes cartoons where the money was running out? You mean the ones where they kept trying to introduce new characters like Bunny and Claude? Exactly. Bunny and Claude, we rob carrot patches. The problem was they didn't have any money anymore because nobody wanted new theatrical cartoons. Hanna-Barbera gets a lot of shit from people because they were cheaply and quickly made, but also they were making cartoons in America for television on a television budget and a television time scale. And the fact that they were able to be as productive as they were while also keeping production within America instead of doing what modern cartoons do, which is outsource it to Asian production companies, is genuinely very impressive, even if the cartoons look bad by our standards. This particular cartoon that they're watching features Yosemite Sam. Uh, look at this. Bugs has Yosemite Sam wearing a dress. <laughs> who debuted in the 1945 cartoon Hair Trigger as a foil to Bugs Bunny. I couldn't find too many instances of Sam performing in a dress, however. I think they've confused him with Elmer Fudd. This happened to Elmer several times. Although there is fan art of Yosemite Sam in all kinds of outfits, if you're looking for that. (laughs) <laughs> and some people are. For some people, you know, Sam is their type. So, you know, they Happy would have... Pride. Howard says that $48 would almost cover the cost of Marion's clippers. $48 a year, which would just about pay for those clippers you're using. Adjusting for inflation, that would mean they cost nearly $500, which would be outrageously expensive for such an item today. There is no way she paid $48 for those clippers. Marion got scammed. Other observations this week. If I were Casey, I'm not sure I'd be comfortable sitting next to Melvin Belvin at Arnold's. What did you think? Yeah, I know continuity is a very fast and loose thing on Happy Days, but uh, yeah. The good news here, though, Peter, is that we have survived the Belvin era of Happy Days. This was the last appearance of Melvin Belvin, and Eugene Belvin is already done. So the Belvin era that started in season eight finally ends in season 10 with this episode. We are done with Belvins forever. (laughs) Good riddance to bad rubbish. I made it through. It was a nice touch to have the barbers wear black armbands, presumably in memory of Rudy. At first, I didn't understand why they were wearing black armbands. I was like, is that a barber thing? Do barbers wear armbands? No, they're wearing black armbands because they're in mourning. Happy Days was in a self-referential mood this week with references to Richie's Cup Runneth Over, Smoking Ain't Cool, and Fonselectomy. You know, the Fonz went to the hospital. I had my tonsils taken out. They fed me ice cream and everything. That's when you know you've been on the air a long time when you have a bunch of old episodes that you can refer to. What did you think of those references to old episodes. Did that dredge up any nostalgia in you? A little bit, yeah. Good job, yeah. Happy Days. Your nostalgia show is making me nostalgic for your show. Fonz, you've got to stop trashing your own place. You own 50% of Arnold's, remember? He keeps forgetting that, Peter. <laughs> well, well, I guess the fact that he owns 50% of it means he can do whatever he wants, as long as he pays for repairs. And if Flip is the new Chachi, is this his hot stuff? Absolutely it is. That felt almost intentional, like they have to have an episode where the new fake Chachi really screws up. Who did the worst thing, Chachi or Flip? Oh gosh, I would say that Flip probably did because I think that almost killing a child is worse than burning down a building. And yet, weirdly enough, I still hate Flip less than I hate Chachi. I I guess that's because at least with Flip, you get the sense that it was mostly Kelly and Mark's fault. I'm pretty sure that Kelly was the one actually driving. Yeah, so it's Kelly's fault. But with Chachi, it's his fault. And don't forget that Chachi nearly got three people killed, and they would have died horribly. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, Chachi's thing was worse. So, Peter, were there any outstanding Happy Days fashions in this episode? I really like Jenny's pink button-down shirt, black vest combo at the beginning of the episode. Very stylish. 
I would also like people to look for one of Ashley's sweaters in this episode. That was a very 80s sitcom dad sweater. So, Peter, I will ask that age-old timeless question. Was this episode any good? The episode that I kept thinking of watching this one was Richie Almost Dies, which is also an episode about a main cast member getting into a vehicular accident. But the difference is that Richie Almost Dies was maudlin and serious, and that kind of made it worse because you knew that Richie wasn't going to actually die. It's in the title. He's in the main cast. They're never actually going to do this. That makes that episode just kind of tedious to watch. And in this one, it kind of has the opposite problem. It's just generally a typical episode of Happy Days, just with a child almost dying in there. It does treat that seriously. They're not making jokes about it, but they are making jokes around it. And that made this episode a little bit uncomfortable to watch, even if it wasn't unpleasant. And I guess it also doesn't help that I was thinking about Heather O'Rourke's real incredibly sad life during this episode. There is a line in this episode when Fonzie says that Heather almost didn't have the chance to grow up. And when you hear that, you can't help but think that Heather O'Rourke really didn't have the chance to grow up. So there is an undercurrent of sadness to this episode that was not even intended by the makers of it. I would say that I Drink Therefore I Am is, as far as Happy Days very special episodes go, at least not painful to watch for the most part. The pace is actually pretty good. And they throw in all this goofy stuff about Fonzie's barber and the Winter Carnival and Bugs Bunny to kind of lighten the mood. So they don't dwell on the darker aspects of this story for too long. They're very aware that this is a sitcom and we have to keep things moving here. So this episode could have been way more maudlin and way more preachy than it was. This isn't one that I would watch for fun. And if you watch Happy Days just for entertainment's sake, this is one you can probably skip because it's not one of the more entertaining ones. But if you have to watch all 255 episodes in a row, this is at least not as torturous as it could have been. That's the best I can say for I Drink Therefore I Am. So, Peter, how can people keep up with us and find out about all the wonderful things that we are doing? Listeners can follow us on Twitter at Fonzie Podcast. They can follow me on Twitter at Peter Volfranc. That's P-E-T-E-R-V-U-L-F-R-A-N-C. And they can follow me on Twitter at Joe underscore A underscore Blevins. They can find this podcast online at thesedaysareours.libson.com. And they can email us with questions, comments, and concerns at thesedaysareourspodcast at gmail.com. So, Peter, what do we have on the docket for next week? Next week, Fonzie tries to help a former convict return to everyday life, and Casey and the Cunninghams kind of ruin it for him. In Prisoner of Love. I don't remember that episode at all, so I'm looking forward to watching it for this podcast. So, see you later, alligator. In a while, crocodile. I took a little drink and I'm a feeling right. I can fly right over everything, everything in sight. There's a slow poking cat, I'm gonna pass him on the right. <laughs> Transfusion, I'm a real gone pale face, and that's no illusion. I'm a never, never, never gonna speed again. Uh, pass the claret to me, Barrett. A uh, rolling down the mountain on a rainy day. Oh, when you see me coming, better start to pray. I'm a cutting up the road, and I'm the boss all the way. Transfusion, transfusion. Oh, Doc, pardon me for this crazy intrusion. I'm never, never, never gonna speed again. Oh, nice hair.